We are now up to part nine in our story of Disney artist Herb Ryman. And we're now moving through key experiences that not only changed Ryman's life, but also changed the Disney studio. In our last episode, we followed Ryman as hundreds of artists, mostly younger artists, worked to unionize the studio, citing low wages and a lack of opportunity for advancement. And today, in this episode, things only get worse. In 1941, Walt Disney understood that his studio was in trouble, a level of financial difficulty that couldn't be solved by any one film. He set his hopes in part on Dumbo, a low-cost feature that had the potential to produce a reasonable profit, even if key European markets remained closed. Beyond this, the studio worked on The Reluctant Dragon, a feature that alternated between a live-action tour of the Disney studio and sections of animation. The live-action segments would be quicker and far less expensive to produce than those focused on animation, which would account for only 40 minutes of the completed film. Even then, some of the animation, such as one section featuring the Casey Jr. Circus Train, would be culled from Dumbo and mostly served to promote its release later in the year. Beyond features, Walt looked to non-traditional sources to fill funding gaps. Though the United States was not yet involved in the European war, for the past year and a half, Canada had sent troops to England. The Canadian government, Walt learned, might be interested in producing short films to better train new recruits, films that could combine live action with inexpensive animation. This, if it worked out, would bring money in to pay salaries while artists weren't working on a feature. But even as Walt struggled to find a path towards solvency, many Disney artists focused on wage inequities began to unionize and threatened to strike. According to Jack Bradbury, by early in 1941, uh, the workers had polarized into two camps for unionizing and against. These camps were largely arranged around seniority and pay. Younger artists, who had only worked for Disney for a few years and remained near the bottom of the pay scale, generally wanted to strike. Many of them believed that the studio had not shared profits from Snow White, instead choosing to invest them in the new studio, a campus where more senior artists not only received higher wages, but also had access to their own offices and to the penthouse club. A few lead artists did join those wishing to strike, most notably animators Art Babbitt and Bill Teitla, who were motivated by longtime political views that favored workers' rights. But most longtime studio artists chose to side with Walt. For them, the decision was more nuanced than simply looking at their paycheck. Many had been hired by Walt during the height of the Depression and looked to their boss as the person who had saved them and, in many cases, their families from financial hardships in the early 1930s. In return, they felt an abiding gratitude that they had not only had jobs while millions waited in breadlines, but they had been able to work as artists. As the union met and explored their options, these older artists easily understood the situation from Walt's perspective. Ward Kimball, a lead animator originally hired in 1934, explained that from his perspective, Walt was a rugged individualist and he felt that union organization was heresy. He felt that he'd given everybody a good break, that they were part of the most successful cartoon studio in the world, so why shouldn't they be happy? Joe Grant, an artist originally hired by Disney in 1933, explained that Walt felt that it was a lack of loyalty and a deliberate plot to upset the studio, which in a sense it was. He felt betrayed. Ryman, however, fit into neither camp. By the time younger artists began to unionize, he had only worked for Disney for a couple of years and had no sense of being cheated out of profits acquired through the release of Snow White, as that picture had been completed months before he'd been hired. But neither did he share the older animator's sense of gratitude, as he had worked at MGM, not Disney, during the height of the Depression. As tensions increased around the studio, 
Ryman continued to identify with the higher paid layout artists, background painters, and members of the story department, many of whom had offices on the third floor of the animation building. Ryman liked Walt, even though he still didn't know him particularly well, and he believed Walt when he said that salaries were tied as best as he was able to the merits of each employee. This idea appealed to him. My philosophy has always been, Ryman said, if somebody is better than I am, they should be paid more than I get. If anybody can do better than I can do, they deserve a better salary. That's always been the way I felt about talent. In this, he believed that the animators' union, at least in part, was proposing a system other than merit to define an artist's salary. But Ryman could also see the opposing side. And there were those who had quite a lot to gain by moving the union in, he said. As the social environment at the studio grew ugly, Ryman, like his friends Ken Anderson and Claude Coates, did their best to focus on Dumbo, a film that had the potential to reduce studio debt. Those of us who were opposed to the unions came in anyway, Ryman said, and did our work. These were difficult times, with most sensing that a strike was inevitable. On May 28th, Walt assured his artists that for those who wanted to work, the studio would remain open even if the union tried to close it down. The following day, the strike began. As the sun lifted above nearby hills, some union members set up a picket line while others managed a sound truck, which was a mobile public address system, so union leaders could call out each person by name who drove onto the lot ignoring the strike to continue work. Workers crossing the picket line were also photographed by the union. A strike camp was set up across the street from Disney's. Animator Jack Bradbury explained, There we held meetings and ate lunches and dinners furnished and prepared by union donations. Hundreds of striking artists carried picket signs. On that first day, most of the signs bore printed slogans such as Walt is unfair and Disney Studio on strike. But in the days that followed, strikers developed elaborate signs with hand-painted Disney characters. Pinocchio pronouncing, there are no strings on me. Pluto sitting next to the slogan, I'd rather be a dog than a scab. And Dumbo carrying the motto, I'm not out for peanuts. It was a spectacle made for the press with photos appearing in newspapers across the Southland. Those were trying months, Ryman said. Relying on a familiar playbook, union officials initially directed group animosity at Walt, who managed the studio. But they quickly amended this policy. Though a few Disney artists resented Walt, union leaders soon learned that many strikers walked the line solely for higher wages, not because of a bitterness they felt toward Mr. Disney. In later strike bulletins, the union was more likely to address grievances at the company than to Walt. At times, they directed their criticism at Disney lawyer Gunther Lessing for his hardline stance on wages and negotiations, as he was a far easier target to garner hatred from most members of the union. At times, the strike affected family and friends. Walt's older daughter, Diane, saw it as a personal campaign arranged against her father. The strike was a nasty one, very personally directed against Dad, she said, believing that the picket signs were cruel and vicious. My sister and I were aware of all of this. At one point, while driving out the lot, Walt was nearly drawn into a fist fight before stepping back into his car. But on most days, the uncomfortable moments were brief, when Walt or his artist drove on and off Disney property. Even though Ryman empathized to some extent with the strikers, he remained with the older artists, those who for the most part were loyal to Walt and committed to the studio. But Ryman understood that he didn't entirely share their outlook. He was grouped with the loyalists because he earned a high wage and because he believed that with years of experience in live action, he brought unique abilities to the studio, along with highly developed skills in drawing and watercolors. In his heart, though, he knew he was different than most of those crossing the picket line, those who did so out of a sense of gratitude and a desire to help save the studio from financial ruin. I wasn't being loyal to Walt, he admitted. I was just being loyal to myself. 
He needed the money both to pay for his house and to support his mother. He needed the work and didn't want to return to MGM as he had soured on that place after the death of Irving Thalberg. He could easily see the framework of the Disney studio falling down in the near future, in part from workers picketing for higher wages, and in part from the enormous debt the studio had taken on to make Pinocchio and Fantasia, as well as to complete the new campus. Days turned into weeks with Ryman and others crossing a massive picket line to work on Dumbo, a feature designed to save the studio. Even in the animation building, artists could hear the strikers as the union had rented sound trucks with their massive conical speakers. There was a different sound truck most every day, but one typically was parked just outside the main gate, amplifying speeches made by union leaders. It was a terrible situation, one without an immediate solution. The troubles weighed down both those working inside the studio and those picketing on the street. The strike lasted so long that the union, on July 10th, posted flyers featuring an angry Mickey Mouse to remind artists, reporters, and local citizens the Disney strike is still on. The strike will not be ended until the Screen Cartoon Guild makes a public announcement to that effect. The union made appeals to the U.S. government to intercede on their behalf. They attempted to arrange a nationwide boycott of Disney films and products. They set up a strike fund to cover rent and utility payments for striking workers. Yet the problems simply rolled forward week after week. It seemed that most working inside the studio would simply need to endure the name calling and threats as they drove onto the lot each day. They would need to continually refuse calls from union friends to join the cause. They could see that even when the strike was resolved, the experience would forever divide some who stayed in the studio from some who walked out. Beyond this, by the end of July, most could sense that a resolution was still weeks if not months away. But Ryman would be spared from seeing the strike's final weeks. Much to his surprise, he would be asked to research material for cartoons arranged for national goals, research that would require him to travel far from the studio into countries thousands of miles away. As the war expanded in Europe, the United States became increasingly concerned about German influence in South America. Argentina, and to a lesser extent Brazil, were viewed as politically volatile and susceptible to Nazi propaganda, which was delivered in newspaper and magazine articles as well as films that offered a pro-German slant. In response, President Roosevelt established the Good Neighbor Policy, which was a public relations campaign to promote political and economic unity among the countries of North, South, and Central America. To manage these efforts, the United States created the Office of the Coordinator of Inter-American Affairs, or the CIAA, directed by Nelson Rockefeller to deepen Western hemispheric solidarity against Axis powers. As part Part of this effort, the CIAA looked to one of the United States' best-known exports, Hollywood films, to persuade South American countries to align themselves with the democratic goals of the West. Some early projects sponsored by the CIAA were poorly received, as Hollywood tended to imagine South America as a unified cultural bloc rather than a collection of individual countries with unique traditions and histories. Worse. Some films relied on tired stereotypes to represent the cultures of the South, including sombreros, serapes, and musical numbers performed by Brazilian-born singer Carmen Miranda. By 1941, thanks to films promoted by the CIAA, some South and Central American audiences believed that Hollywood filmmakers, or at least some of them, looked down on them with contempt, picturing Central and South America as a collection of stereotypes. Worse from these films, they surmised that Americans didn't know the cultural differences between Brazil, Peru, and Mexico, whereas Hollywood directors expected worldwide wide audiences to know the lifestyle differences between New York, Los Angeles, and Miami. One of the underlying problems was that Hollywood studios, when they did incorporate Latin themes, tried to present the breadth of South and Central American countries in a single film. 
without realizing that such homogenization would be offensive to Latin audiences. The problem was, in part, a lack of research, but also the feature film was an ineffective format through which to embrace Central and South America. A feature that offered a realistic presentation of Brazil could be seen as excluding Argentina. A feature that offered a realistic presentation of Argentina could be seen as excluding Peru and so on. The CIAA's plan for the Disney Studio would overcome these limitations. Though the Disney Studio did create features, they were far better known for the production of six and seven minute cartoon shorts. Instead of the CIAA promoting Latin cultural elements in a feature, they could contract for the production of mini cartoons with each cartoon set in a different Central or South American country. Cartoons were so short that one might even focus on a specific city. Moreover, as Disney cartoons were, with minor exceptions, almost wholly focused on comedy and music, they would not be viewed as an obvious source for political manipulation. These cartoons might be America's best opportunity to create pan-American unity as the European war spread around the globe. In the spring of 1941, as talks developed between the CIAA and the studio, Walt explained what he would and would not do for the CIAA. They first wanted me to go on a handshaking goodwill tour, he said, and I said, I'm not a good handshaker and everything. And then they came back and said, will you go down and make some films about these countries? The films didn't need to be political in nature, only demonstrate that the Disney studio, and therefore America, was interested in the culture and people of Central and South America, and was intent on creating goodwill and understanding between the regions. To this, Walt replied, I can do that. As the picketers lined up in front of the studio, Walt quietly asked his story department to imagine South American narratives that could be arranged into short subjects. As with previous projects, the story team looked to research for inspiration. In terms of an overall strategy, they imagined this project exactly as they had other cartoon series made by the studio. In the 1930s, Disney had produced two series of cartoon shorts. The first, under the heading of Mickey Mouse, was focused on the comic adventures of familiar Disney characters. The second, called The Silly Symphonies, presented musical adventures with unique characters who often appeared in just one title. For the South American project, story artists developed a strategy in which roughly half of the Good Neighbor cartoons would present unique characters tied to individual countries engaged in musical shorts, and roughly half would present the adventures of Disney characters such as Donald and Goofy finding trouble in Central and South America. This framework was so deeply arranged in the Disney strategy that the proposed musical cartoons were initially grouped under the name Disney's Pan American Symphonies. By July, during the height of the strike, Walt understood that a team of artists needed to visit South America with the aim of deepening the visual and narrative authenticity of the shorts. The CIAA insisted that the visit include goodwill appearances, with some arranged around the premiere of Fantasia in South American countries. In terms of an itinerary, the trip was organized to target those countries that the U.S. believed were most susceptible to Nazi influence. The Disney team would first visit Brazil, staying for a week, then spend many weeks in Argentina. Travel accommodations in Rio and Buenos Aires, along with key public appearances, would be arranged by a small team traveling in advance of Walt. But after Argentina, Walt and his artists would be free to explore other countries in South and Central America that interested them to develop material for the screen. The CIAA would support Disney travel and cover any losses if the cartoons did not produce a profit. This last part deeply interested Walt. In an era where Disney animation had recently lost money, these cartoons were guaranteed to break even, producing enough money to cover the salaries of hundreds of artists and technicians. The trip ultimately was a compromise between the artistic needs of the Disney Studio and the political needs of the CIAA.
Walt would make public appearances, but his artist would have ample time, particularly in the trip's final weeks, to explore countries as they liked, with an eye toward researching material for cartoon shorts. In late July, as strikers ringed the studio and as negotiations to end the strike repeatedly failed, Walt considered artists for this trip. It went without saying that they would need to be artists who were inside the studio working on films, not artists holding picket signs. He also needed to exclude artists, primarily animators, whose work was essential to finish Dumbo for a Christmas release. Beyond this, Walt needed to focus on those artists whose work was keyed to the early development of cartoon shorts. He needed, of course, story artists, but he needed someone to focus on Latin American music to anchor these cartoons to individual regions. Lastly, as cartoons would be centered on a presentation of place, he needed sketch artists and painters to capture the identity of each country in art, drawings and watercolors that would then visually define cartoons created back in Burbank. Inside the studio, Walt had hundreds of artists from whom to choose, including well-rounded individuals such as Ken Anderson and Claude Coates, who had previously captured the essence of real-world environments while working at MGM and Universal. Both of these men had worked at Disney for six years, proving themselves in multiple departments. But at some point, Vern Caldwell, Chenard's business manager, had a conversation with Walt to discuss the possibility of Herb Ryman joining this group. Though Ryman had worked with Disney for just over two years, he had experiences and abilities that might elevate him above other sketch artists such as Anderson and Coates. Ryman had not only created sketches that defined regions as diverse as England, France, and China for productions at MGM, he had traveled on his own to Europe and Asia specifically to capture the identity of these regions in sketches and watercolors. Beyond this, Ryman was an excellent artist. Exactly how much influence Caldwell had over Walt is open to speculation, but the conversation appears to have persuaded him. Not long after this conversation, probably in the first week of August, Caldwell found Ryman at Chenard, where he still taught a course in set design. Herb, Caldwell said, have you ever been to South America? No, no, I never have. Well, I think... I think you'll be going. Ryman, now curious, looked at the older man. Tell me more. I'm not supposed to tell you any more. Then he explained that Ryman would likely find out about the trip from an official source. Uh, the following day, Ryman explained, I got a phone call from Walt Disney's office, and his secretary said, Herb, would you come in? Walt's having a meeting. He wants to talk to you. Ryman went up to Walt's office, a large corner suite, and once inside he saw a dozen people key to the studio, loyalists who had not gone out for the union. Once everyone was assembled, Walt explained the nature of this trip. As Ryman recalled, they would fly uh, down to South America, to Brazil and Argentina and Ecuador and Bolivia and Chile to do a research tour on ethnic customs, musical customs, and dancing customs of South America for the purpose of what was called at that time atmospheric solidarity. The trip was also necessary to keep the studio solvent. Walt explained that there was a possibility of setting up a studio in Buenos Aires to animate or partially animate these shorts if labor problems at the Burbank studio limited production. If so, some of the Disney staff might be able to work in South America until the end of the year or perhaps even through 1942. Walt looked out at the artist around him, his eyes moving from one person to the next. He pointed at each of us, Ryman recalled. He pointed at Norm Ferguson and he said, you're going to be the producer. You're going to be the guy who holds all this together. Then he pointed at Chuck Walcott. Chuck was going to be in charge of the music. Then he said, now Herbie, you're going to do the color backgrounds and the styling for the jungles and the styling for the local scenes in South America. Ryman stood there with the other artists, many of whom had had far longer careers with the Disney Studios. Three artists, Jack Cutting, Bill Cottrell, and Norm Ferguson, for example, had been with Walt since 1929. 
Story artist Ted Sears and Webb Smith had been there since 1931. Frank Thomas, the only animator in the group, had worked at the studio since 1934. Yet Walt had chosen Ryman. It was as though Walt could see into him and understand his past with clarity and appreciate how his skills might uniquely contribute to this project. This experience, assuming Ryman correctly understood the details, would be remarkably similar to his trip to Europe and Asia. Only Disney and the CIAA would not only pick up the tab, but pay him a salary. The drawings and paintings, of course, would be in service of Disney cartoons. But once more, he'd travel through interesting countries, sketching out people and places, trying to capture the complexity of a region with his art. The plan as it existed in August 1941 was that the Disney artist would research Brazil, Argentina, and then other countries to be determined at a later date. Walt and some members of the traveling party would investigate the possibility once in Buenos Aires to start a new studio there and to remain there indefinitely, though details about a South American branch studio were at best thin. Officially, the artist were to focus on individual shorts set in South American locales, though a few in the group were already considering that perhaps some subjects might be combined into one full-length cartoon feature along the lines of Fantasia that packaged together short presentations into a longer project. That night, Ryman drove home to explain these plans to his mother, Cora, who now lived with him in his Van Nuys house. He said that he would be gone for many weeks, perhaps two or three months. He also explained that there was a possibility that after the main trip, he might work at a temporary Disney studio in Argentina. If so, his mother could live with him there. The trip included a handful of individuals beyond artists and technicians. Traveling with them would be the studio publicist, Janet Martin, Walt's wife, Lillian, and Bill Cottrell's wife, Hazel, who was Walt Disney's sister-in-law. Though many artists lived near the studio, the Cottrells lived in Van Nuys, a short walk from Herbie's house. Over the last two years, Herbie and the Cottrells had spent a little time together, though the trip would solidify their relationship and, by extension, also bring Herbie deeper into the extended Disney family. On August 6th, Jack Cutting, who oversaw international distribution, began his multi-day flight to Rio de Janeiro. He was followed four days later by John Rose, who oversaw the story department. Together, the two would finalize hotel accommodations, office space, and official events before other artists arrived in the middle of the month. Ryman would be in the next group to begin the journey south. In 1941, no commercial airline managed direct flights across the country, let alone from Los Angeles to Rio de Janeiro. So Ryman and the other Disney artists scheduled five flights, many of them taking an entire day to travel from California to Brazil. Due to limited space for personal luggage, the Disney artists needed to dress for winter in South America while flying across the U.S. during the high point of summer. Among those in Ryman's traveling group, Lee and Mary Blair explained that uh, packing for a trip in another country and different climate has its difficulties, especially when they had to keep within the restricted luggage weight limits set by the airlines. Many of the men traveled in wool sports jackets and pants suitable for cold weather. Mary Blair herself wore an overcoat. On the first day of travel, Sunday, August 10th, Ryman met eight other artists and studio employees, including publicist Janet Martin, at the Lockheed Terminal, which was located in North Burbank. In 1941, Lockheed was the main airfield for commercial travel in the Los Angeles area. The group flew on a propeller-driven DC-3 from Burbank to Indianapolis, which was less than 200 miles from where Ryman had grown up. Ryman's sister, Christine, met them there. 
While Herbie enjoyed time with his sister, others ventured into town hoping to visit the museum at the John Heron Art Institute, but were disappointed to find that it was closed. They later returned to the airport, met Ryman, and took a second flight to Miami. In Miami, the high that day was 90 three degrees, one of the warmest days of the year. Still dressed in wool clothes, they explored the city and ventured down to the sea. On Tuesday, August 12th, Ryman wrote a postcard to his mother. I got here last night, it began, all day at the beach today, and taking film of Pan Air Clippers. We leave here early tomorrow. The following morning, as the sun brightened across the horizon, Ryman arrived at the airport for the first international leg of their trip, which would take them to Trinidad. All through the journey, the Disney team was deeply aware of how the war shaped the environment. Commercial planes only flew during the day so the military wouldn't mistake them for enemy aircraft. There is no flying on beam in South America. Janet Martin explained, and this means every ship has to set down at its destination by sunset. As the plane prepared to land, the flight crew covered the windows, explaining to the Disney artist that this was another precaution to protect the security of the airfield in case a spy was on board. From there, the group traveled to Belém, Brazil, a city at the edge of the jungle, which finally made Ryman and the others feel as though they were in South America. From Bellum, they took one final flight to Rio, where, when they stepped off the plane, they found the air to be much cooler than in Miami. They met Jack Cutting and John Rose, the two early leads, and then settled into their hotel rooms as they waited for Walt and the other Disney artists to reach the city. On August 17th, Herbie wrote home, Today, Walt and the rest of the party arrive. It has been so hard to get reservations here. We may not all be at the same hotel. As it turned out, members of the Disney family, Walt and Lillian, along with Walt's in-laws, Bill and Hazel Cottrell, stayed at the better-known Copacabana Palace, while the rest of the party stayed at the Hotel Gloria. Ryman was once again far from home, tucked into an enormous hotel that, on one side, open to the ocean, and on the other, to a neighborhood just north of Rio. Hotel Gloria was a gorgeous pile of cement and windows with decorative peaks and high balconies. The Disney team was now 6,000 miles away from the strife that still encircled the studio. But down here, the various artists and technicians were tasked with a different job to research ideas for a set of short cartoons, pieces of animation to influence world cultures, foreign policy cleverly arranged as art and entertainment. I'll be back next week with a new episode. But as you can see, we're moving into some interesting experiences with Herb Ryman. This is the part of his life where he begins to move into Walt's inner circle. I've been thinking this week of the various artists whose lives we've explored over the years. The very first person we looked at almost 10 years ago was Harriet Burns. It was a short, single episode, and back then we were just getting going. But over time, we've looked at animator Ward Kimball, artist John Hench, the Sherman Brothers' Dick Nunes, Dick Humor who was an early animator whose career starts in some of the first animation studios in New York before he moves on to Disney, the original landscape architect of Main Street, Tomorrowland, and Frontierland in Disneyland, Ruth Shellhorn, which is in a series called Landscaping the Kingdom, Ken Anderson and his early work on animatronics, and many more. If you've been following us for years, Hopefully, these series have deepened your enjoyment of Disney films and the parks. There's nothing I would like more. And if you're a new listener, you can find many of these series now over on Bandcamp. We're an ad-free, listener-supported podcast. We do just two things. Deep dives on stories related to the history of the Disney studio and the parks, and news and analysis of current events as they relate to the Disney company. We are funded entirely by listener contributions. You can support our efforts by becoming a monthly Bandcamp subscriber. 
It's been a while since I've counted the episodes over on Bandcamp, but I did so this week. I was surprised to find that there are now well over 300 episodes on Bandcamp, many of them not available anywhere else. Some of them are arranged inside of albums which last for hours and collect together many individual episodes in a series. The episodes over there cover everything from the early days of animation to attractions in the parks that opened this past year. You can drive back and forth across the country many times without getting to the end of all of these episodes. But the best reason to subscribe is to support the work we do here and to make sure that this podcast continues to exist. You can become a monthly subscriber at dhipodcast.bandcamp.com. I'll also leave a link down in the show notes. Until next time, this is Todd James Pierce.